imagine, imagine that this is the way God thinks, okay? And this is the way that the man thinks, right? So when these two are like this, you get what's called an interference pattern, all right? When your mind is renewed, it begins to line up with your spirit. When it lines up with your spirit, spirit can flow freely through your soul, through your flesh, and to other people. But as long as you have any belief system that would challenge God's availability and His goodness, okay, if you have anything like that, immediately you'll block it. In the back of your manual, if you have one, there's a couple of different things. We'll get to these at the end anyway. But you'll see that there's a subject there on page 75 called Dealing with Failure. Okay? I want you to know we're going to deal with failure. How many of you would like that? Okay. So we're going to deal with failure and how to deal with it. All right? And how to... How to do the best you can to avoid it, all right? Now, like I've said before, there's only one type of failure, or well, two types of failure. One is failing to start, and two is failing to continue. Okay? You can write that down, quote me if you want, it's fine. There's only two types of failure, failure to start and failure to continue. Because everything else is learning. Everything else is an experience that will teach you how to do it better next time. When you learn to drive a car, I'm pretty sure you stalled a couple of times. <laughs> but that didn't stop you. You would have failed at learning to drive a car if that stopped you. Stalling the car wasn't a failure. Stalling the car was a temporary setback on a learning curve. Does that make sense? It's a very, very powerful understanding. If you understand these, these things this way, then you will not see anything the enemy brings at you as a final thing. And trust me, he will. He will. Because, listen, the devil doesn't mind if you go to church, sit in your chair every Sunday, praise and worship God, do all the things you do. He doesn't mind if you do that. He really doesn't. But you just have to start becoming an active Christian. The market and buy a quad. Okay? Why? Make him very angry because now you're starting to help people and you're starting to advance the kingdom and he cannot have that. Okay? In order for his lie to perpetuate, in order for his lie to have authority, he must have the sons and daughters of God, passive. So pacification of the children of God is his key strategy and he uses divide and conquer to achieve it. Okay? So he will separate and overcome. Because when you're on your own and you have no one to encourage you, then you believe whatever you hear. Especially when you don't have a good relationship with Papa. Does it make sense? So, you're in a tough situation. It's either going to drive you to Jesus or it's going to drive you away from Jesus. The devil's hoping it'll drive you away. Okay? God does not use the devil like a dog on a leash. God doesn't have a pet called the devil that he unleashes on people to try and teach them a lesson. God does not use the devil to teach you anything. The devil knows one thing, well, three things. Steal, kill, destroy. It's his nature. He doesn't need an invitation. He only needs an opportunity. Right? And the minute you begin to stand for truth, he can't stand that, so he'll do whatever he can to try and stop that. Okay? So you've got to understand that because... As soon, as long as you believe that God is the author of calamity, you will not know whether you should resist it or accept it. 
Because who can resist God? Now Jesus, didn't he say that whoever hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who builds his house on the rock and when the storm comes, his house will stand? So did he say, I will send the storm? Or did he say the storm will come? It's because storms will come. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, you will have trouble in this life. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Do you understand? So there's a, there's a dynamic here you have to understand. The enemy has free will just as much as you do. And by free will he has chosen to rebel against God and to take all of you with him. And he will do whatever he can to paint a picture of God that, you, that makes you believe that God is against you so that you will no longer trust him. Because the minute you trust him, the devil's got nothing he can do. He needs you to not trust him. So he'll do whatever he can to push you away from God, to make you afraid of God, to try and paint a picture of God that's a twisted perversion of who he really is. Not everyone agreed with Jesus, but everyone wanted to be around him. Because he was love. D does that make sense? Okay, so it's very, very important that we have a healthy perspective of who God is because otherwise we will, not in, we will not introduce people that we evangelize to the Father. We will introduce them to a version of the Father that we are holding to. And you will treat people the way that you believe God treats you. So when you believe God is judgmental of you, that, judges, that God is constantly after you, that you're, God is very performance-based, that He's like the big guy in the sky with a, a gray beard, with a big fly squatter waiting to smack you one. If you think that is who God is, you, number one, are not believing the God of the Bible, but you're actually into Greek mythology. It's like Zeus throwing lightning bolts. Okay? You need to believe the God of the Bible who even the prophets got frustrated with because of how long-suffering God was, how quick to mercy He was, how He relented from punishment because He was merciful and full of compassion. Do you remember Jonah? Why did Jonah not go to Nineveh? Why did Jonah not go to Nineveh? Maybe you'll think because Jonah was afraid of Nineveh. But because Jonah knew that God would have mercy on Nineveh. And Jonah wanted Nineveh to burn. He didn't want Nineveh to have mercy. So he runs away. Now watch this. Jonah is so, he's, even in his rebellious state, he is so trusting of God that even when he jumps off the, the boat, he knows God will look after him. He's got more faith than most Christians. It's true. He's in rebellion to God. God says, go to Nineveh. He runs the opposite direction. And then in the end, when God gets him to Nineveh, and he goes and he speaks to Nineveh, right? And Nineveh repents, and God relents. Now Jonah's mad. Now he's mad. You read the end of the book of Jonah. He says, you see, this is exactly why I didn't want to come here. Yeah. See, I knew it. You are always so merciful and full of compassion. And this is not right because these people should burn. He's mad. He goes and he sits down and he's waiting to see if these guys are going to carry on sinning again. Let's see. Let's see what happens to the city. Let's see if their repentance is real. These people. He sits there. He's in, and so God, God makes this hot wave come past me. He's like almost faints. And then God grows a tree up next to him. And he likes the tree because the tree is giving him shade. So he's sitting there. And then a day later, the tree dies. And now, now he's mad. He's like, just kill me. Just kill me already. Just, just take me. Now, I don't want to be here anymore. This is, so, so God says to him, are you allowed to be upset? He's like, yes, I'm allowed to be upset, God. I'm allowed to be upset even unto death. This is how he spoke to God. God says to him, Jonah, 
Are you concerned about this tree? He said, yes. I am concerned about this tree. And I'm angry about this tree even unto death. He's very, like a drama queen, man. He's this crazy guy. So if God can use him, he can use you, I promise. I mean, that's one thing Jonah taught me. Is if God can use Jonah, anyone. Anyone. Anybody. So then, Jonah sits there, right? And he is mad. Man, he's like a beehive. He is mad. And God says to him, how can you be upset over a tree that you never caused to grow? That, about its life and what it did. How can you be upset about it? But then be upset about me, for, with me for saving a whole nation, not to mention all the livestock that lives within it. God is full of mercy. God, how many of you have seen The Man of Steel, the new Superman movie? Where Zod comes and... Yeah, some of you don't watch these movies, obviously. Okay, so how many of you know who Superman is? <laughs> right, okay. So there is, there's this villain guy, right? And he is actually Superman's dad's cousin or brother or something. Friend or something like that. And he's hell-bent on recreating the whole of Krypton, which is the planet where Superman comes from, okay? But now Superman, he's grown up here on this planet with mankind, and he has a heart for man, okay? So he wants to save mankind, and Zod will stop at nothing to destroy mankind. And all the way through the fighting sequence where he's fighting Zod, at the end, He's got Zod in like an arm lock and he's shooting out like fire beams out of his eyes and he's about to kill this innocent family. And he's telling him, stop. And he says, I will never stop. And as a last resort, Superman breaks his neck. Okay? But you could see that was the last thing he wanted to do. God's judgment is his final, final solution. It's not the first thing he goes for. God does not execute judgment just like this. God is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is full of compassion. And He is very patient. Does it make sense? It is the last thing God wants for anyone to go to hell. He was so, God was so determined to get us to avoid that punishment that He was willing to become one of us and die for us so we could have a way out. That is how much mercy and compassion God has. You've got to understand. Because a lot of us, we've got such a picture of God that God is so judgmental, so um, always looking for fault, always trying to find a reason to come against us. And you know the reason why we think that way? is because of the law. Because the law teaches you to live by a certain standard. And the more you look at that standard, the more you fail it. Now, there's nothing wrong with the law, but because the law is constantly accusing you, or well, you think it's the law accusing you, but it's actually the devil accusing you using the law. Okay? Because the devil is constantly accusing you using the law, you think that God is constantly accusing you. And when you think God is constantly accusing you, how can you believe it is for you? You can't. But He is for you. Does that make sense? Because the law itself isn't the full picture of God. It's just a reflection of God's nature. God doesn't murder. He doesn't lie. He doesn't steal. He doesn't do these things. So the nature of God is the reflection of the law. Does it make sense? Okay. So, but God's law is spiritual. But when you, are, when you are not saved, when you are alienated from God, you are only of the flesh. And you could never live up to the law. It was designed to show you that you couldn't live up to it. What you needed was the Spirit of God to empower you to be like Him again. Does that make sense? Alright, that's why we no longer live by the letter of the law, but we now live by the Spirit of it. What's the Spirit of it? Love, mercy, justice. Love and mercy. Isn't that right? For mercy has triumphed over judgment. Can we live in a world where we truly love one another the way Jesus has loved us? Do you think it's possible? What do you think a community of people will look like that truly decide to love each other the way that Jesus loved them? 
What, what do you think it would look like? Okay, hands up, who wants that? Okay, then why don't we have it? Because it's up to you. And it's not, well, they don't do it, so then why should I? Because you just missed the point. Be the change you want to see. If everyone would just be the change they want to see, everyone would have change. That's why the Bible says, don't try and find the log in your brother's eye. When, I mean the speck, sorry, in your brother's eye, when you have a log in your own. I could say that was on purpose, but it was actually a mistake. Why? First remove the log out of your own eye, so you can then help your brother with the speck in his eye. Right? So first make sure you're right, before you can say, okay, let me help you. It's supposed to be help. It's not supposed to be, well, you see, look at all the things you're doing wrong. You don't belong here. It's not fault finding. It's help. How, when your children don't do well at school, do you tell them, okay, you're obviously just pathetic and useless at the subject, so just give it up? Why not? That's how most of the world treats one another. Even people in the church treat one another that way. If you don't get it right the first time, you're never going to get it. You might as well just do something else. It is nonsense. Everyone learns to get better at something. And when someone does something one way and you're there to help guide them, that's actually called loving them. Isn't that right? When you take your time and you spend it with someone else at their benefit, that's called loving them. That's self-sacrificing. Is this making sense? Yes. The nature of God. Listen, you're going to get a healthy dose of who you really are when you're here. This is what I'm aiming for. Because if you can understand who you really are, when you get out there, no matter what circumstance you face, you will act like Jesus. Jesus lives in you, right? Okay, so what happens when you chop, off some, when you chop some oranges off a tree and you squeeze them out into a glass? Okay, you got... What do you have in the glass after you've squeezed this orange out into the glass? What do you have? Okay, now imagine you take a big gulp of this orange juice, right? And it tastes just like Coca-Cola. What would you go? What would you think? Would you think that's strange? Would you think that unusual? Would you be shocked and surprised? So then why are we not shocked and surprised when, when Christians are squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out? When you're under pressure, Jesus is supposed to come out. If Jesus comes out, the devil backs off. The secret weapon to winning is letting Jesus out. You can't win. Listen, you can't win. Jesus said, I overcame the world. Let him out. I've done this. I've tested it. It works. It really does. And, I, and I'll share some testimony on that a little bit later. 